Recording from my living room in beautiful Marietta, Georgia, you are listening to the Think Inclusive Podcast, Episode 8. I'm your host, Tim Viegas. Today I will be speaking with Dr. Julie N. Coston, an Associate Professor in the Department of Teaching and Leadership at Syracuse University and creator of the website Inspire Inclusion, which has a 10-part video series about inclusion for parents of children with disabilities. I had the pleasure of visiting with her one evening in November of last year. Julie and I discuss the necessary steps for schools to become more inclusive, which include professional development, reimagining school district service delivery model, and using the law as leverage for systems change. This is one of the most interesting conversations on the podcast to date, so please, if you can, listen to the entire episode. So, without further ado, let's get to the Think Inclusive podcast. Thanks for listening. Uh, joining us today on the Think Inclusive podcast is Dr. Julie N. Coston, and she is an associate professor in the Department of Teaching and Leadership at Syrac- Syracuse University. She's also the creator of the website Inspire Inclusion, which includes a 10-part video series about inclusion for parents of children with, with disabilities. She also been, has been involved with research on inclusive practices, including the landmark project Schools of Promise. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Tim. Um, well, let's go ahead and, and dig right in. Um, the reason mm-hmm. why I wanted to to get you on the the podcast was because uh, of the work that you you did uh, with a research project called Schools of Promise, um, and I know that was a while ago, uh, mm-hmm. but I, I was hoping that it, we could talk a little bit about um, this particular research and tell our audience about your involvement and if you agree that this was um, a good example of how inclusive education can be possible for all students. Yeah, definitely. So Schools of Promise began um, a while ago, almost maybe eight years ago, and uh, my colleagues at Syracuse University and I were teaching about how to create inclusive schools with our undergraduates. So we teach teachers how to teach general and special education in inclusive settings. And we were placing our students in city schools nearby Syracuse University, and we were finding that we weren't seeing very good models of inclusive education locally. Um, So what the concern was that we were teaching them something that they couldn't see in practice. So right away we decided that one of the best things to do would be to begin to look at the schools that were um, currently placed, where we were placing our students, and look to see if we could work with the schools to become more inclusive. And so what we did is we went to the superintendent of uh, Syracuse City Schools at the time, and we asked if anybody was interested in being involved in our project. Um, We ended up getting a lot of schools that were interested, and we worked with those schools that had 80% or more of the teachers really on board with becoming more inclusive, and we had done some um, surveys and things to figure that out. So we ended up starting with two different schools. in Syracuse. And basically when we say school reform, what we mean is that we worked with the entire school staff. Um, and it was a pretty typical school, Tim. It would have been, um, you know, a school that had pull-out classrooms where um, kids would be pulled out like resource rooms. And then there were segregated classrooms in those schools. And then there were also some, some classrooms that were more inclusive. Mm-hmm. And in order to be involved in the partnership, we said that they would be willing to get rid of their segregated classrooms and their resource room pull-out programs. And all children with all disability labels would be included in the general education content and curriculum. Mm-hmm. And so we, be- we began work with uh, those schools, and we spent about three years, well, more than that, uh, three to five years with each school. And we worked alongside them as they restructured their school, and they got rid of their segregated or pull-out programs. And all the kids with with, uh, disabilities were in the general ed classroom. And the work that we did mostly was about professional development and teaching teachers how to create inclusive classrooms, how to differentiate content, how to support kids with challenging behaviors, um, and how to collaborate effectively with their colleagues. And so um, that was the work that we had done. 
and it was great work. And we really, the, the schools looked different um, in terms of no children were segregated any longer. But what surprised us with the research was the academic results. Mm. So, so we went in, you know, much like you, Tim, kind of at your gut level, you think inclusion might be the best idea for children, um, you know, on, on lots of different levels. I, I knew that to be true. But what we didn't expect in our research was that there was such a great big academic gain for not only children with disabilities, but their peers without disabilities, um, you know, did better in these classrooms. And so that was kind of the bigger surprise in our research study um, across reading, across math, across social studies, across science, across state, uh, state tests, everything. We found that kids actually did better academically when they were included. So this research project took us from um, kind of the social justice reasons of including kids mm-hmm. uh, to really academic performance reasons uh, in terms of including kids. And what's interesting is since the schools of promise schools, we've had, um, I mean, the schools have been recognized as schools of excellence and things like that, which is great. But the thing that has been really interesting is that we've been able to replicate those same results in multiple schools across the country. We're not calling it schools of promise, but we're doing a lot of school reform work like that. And we're finding the same academic achievement results. And so now what's interesting is a lot of times when I'm talking to administrators about why to include students, I'm actually using the academic achievement gains as the number one reason to include kids with disabilities. Do you find that that is more effective (laughs) at, uh, at convincing Seven administrators? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so everybody right now is interested in, you know, the bottom line, their test scores, their cut scores, the common core, making sure that everybody has access to that. And so when we can actually show with real numbers and real children in real schools, and I, I don't want to say these schools are perfect. They're still not perfect. Uh, they're decent schools with great teachers working hard. Um, but the point is, I'm getting a lot of leverage around inclusion because we've got hard data that shows that children do better when they're in inclusive classrooms than they do when they're sent down the hall or when their day is really segregated and separated where they're in for an hour and then out for another hour and then back in and then back out because what we find is students miss so much during those transition times in and out of the classroom. And so it only makes sense, right, that students that spend their days in the Common Core, learning along with their peers in really creative, interesting ways, they're going to do better academically. Um, now, did you have a strategy to deal with, um, I, and I guess I'm not just talking about the the early schools of promise, but um, with, okay. with the schools that you've been working on, uh, working mm-hmm. with recently, um, what strategies were you using uh, with with the teachers to deal with challenging behavior because that is probably the number one reason that yeah. um, supervisors and teachers will give me about why a student cannot be included in general education. Yeah, so you're right. Um, challenging behavior is one of the reasons that students are segregated, probably the number one reason that students are not included in general education. So what we do is we spend a lot of time talking about why students behave the way they do. Mm -hmm. And when you create a community where students feel like they belong as real members of a general education classroom and you provide differentiated instruction, students usually behave much better than in schools where they're separated and segregated out. So that's a piece of it, right? Creating that community feel so Mm -hmm. students feel like they belong. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is we talk a lot about um, why students behave the way they might, the way they do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we find is that um, I often ask teachers, "What are the you know most challenging behaviors you see? What are the most dangerous, concerning, challenging behaviors you see in your school?" And they make this long list like swearing, kicking, hitting, biting, running, um, threatening, threatening staff, threatening others, um, you know, screaming, all this kind of stuff. 
And the funny thing is, as I write this list on the board or on the computer, wherever I'm doing the presentation, and then I say to them, okay, look at this list. Has anybody in this room participated in any of these same behaviors yourself as an adult, right? And so sheepishly hands go up, right? Because things like swearing and (laughs) fighting and running and shutting down and crying and screaming are all on the list, right? Mm -hmm. And so everyone raises their hand in the room. And so I always make a joke like, look around, your colleagues, your esteemed colleagues have the most dangerous, concerning, challenging behaviors we see in our schools, right? (laughs) And then I say to them, now, honestly, when you have these challenging behaviors that you're admitting to me right now, what do you need? And then they say things like, I need someone to listen to me. I need a hug. I need love. I need connection. I need empathy. I need um, space. I need time. I need a food. I need water. They often jokingly say, I need a glass of wine, you know, <laughs> stuff like that, right? And so I tell them, you know what you've just done? You've written the best behavior plan that's out there, right? What you've explained Oh, and then the other funny thing is I say to them, after I take all the re- the things that they need when they have this challenging behavior, I take them all and I write them down. And then I say something like, well, how come nobody said they just needed a sticker chart? <laughs> right? how come? Yeah. I said, I've, I've done the same activity in hundreds of school districts around the country, and nobody said, I just need a sticker chart. And yet our number one response to behavior in school is a sticker chart. And so that's an interesting question, and people have a lot of great answers to that. Obviously, one of the biggest answers is because you're not addressing the actual student need, right? You're just sort of masking it and dealing with it um, in external fashion as opposed to kind of intrinsically responding to the student's need. Mm. And so instead, you know, they list all those things that they need, you know, time and space and care and love and comfort and all that kind of stuff. And I say, you've just done it. You've just written the very best behavior plan I've ever seen, right? Because essentially, human behavior is no different for children. And one of the things we have to really think about is what kids need in the moment and how we can give them what they need in terms of support and kindness and love and connection compared to exclusion. So our typical responses are sticker chart, um, exclusion, meaning, you know, you misbehaved, out you go, and we know that creates a cycle. And so one of the things I do is kind of get them to understand the behavior, challenging behavior is the actual human response, and it means something. And if we don't deal with that, we're not going to get to kids who behave well. And that in conjunction with tons and tons of strategies and ideas about how to make learning fun and engaging and how to differentiate so students aren't working at their frustration level all the time, um, kind of in concert with really effective community building, creates the recipe for classrooms where students don't have a lot of challenging behavior. Right, right. Yeah. Now, now I know, you know, I know where you're coming from. Um, uh-huh. And when I hear you talk, you know, about behavior and, you know, um, I guess unmet needs, right? Right. As, as kind of the core of what, of where Mm -hmm. challenging behavior comes from. Mm -hmm. I get that. But how do you, how do you have professionals, education, educators who don't have that prior knowledge of how behavior works? How Mm do you, how do you get, um, people to understand because it's a different way of thinking about behavior. It's a, it's a different way of, uh, of, of looking at it because so many educators, um, um, want to, uh, or I guess we would hear that and say, well, you're coddling those children, you know, mm-hmm. you are creating little mm-hmm. monsters. Right. It, it is interesting because it actually flies in the face of what we think to be true about behavior, right? Mm -hmm. So what we think to be true is antecedent behavior consequence, right? Apply a consequence because of the behavior, 
you know, um, and we will reduce that negative behavior. And it absolutely kind of flies in the face of that way of looking at behavior. And it's very much, I mean, you could look at it through the antecedent, but instead you really just look at it as what might this student need. And actually the number one strategy that I su- suggest from teachers is to ask the student, what do you need right now? And to name the, name the behavior. You know, when I'm looking at the, when I'm looking at you right now, it looks like you might be really frustrated because you're banging your head or because you're yelling. And I'm not sure. Are you frustrated? We start there. You just figure out what's happening. Are you angry? Or are you, you know, just try to get a sense of it. And then you ask the student themselves what they need. So your question, Tim, is how do I get teachers to sort of see this in a different way? Mm-hmm. Um, I have the very good fortune of getting to spend tons of time educating teachers. And so a lot of it happens in um, my professional development with them. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, uh, very often in professional development sessions, in fact, this, this week I did a, a, a big professional development um, class for a whole school district about behavior. And what I did is I started out with a behavior chart that had the red, yellow, green. Have you ever seen one of those kind of charts before? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So these teachers walk into their PD session, and their names are big in the front of the room. With they're all, They all start on green. So a green picture, kind of a stoplight system. If, if our listeners don't know what it is, it's really, you know, a green light means you're doing fine, and a yellow is a warning, and a red means, you know, you're in trouble. So as these teachers file into the professional development session, they see their name publicly up front, and they see that they're all on green. And so I explained to them that throughout this presentation, I'm going to be, um, you know, needing to monitor their behavior because, to be honest, teachers are some of the kind of worst audience members. <laughs> so I, I jokingly say that, but there's some truth to that, right? Mm-hmm. And so... Um, as I start right away, as soon as people are talking, side conversations or whatever, I'll go tell them to pull a card. That means move from green to yellow and then again from yellow to red. <laughs> and um, what I tell them, it depends where I am. At the university where I'm teaching, if they get to red, they have to write a five-page paper that includes all the readings for the semester. And if I'm in a school district, um, I tell them that if they get to red, they're going to need to have a meeting with me and their um, administrators to discuss their behavior, right? And so, um, okay, so we do this. And what's super fascinating is uh, I can get human beings to behave. And by behave, I mean sit tall and be quiet and uh, not fool around, essentially. But after about 20 minutes of me doing this behavior system, and I'll usually call many people out on their behavior, and there's a lot of laughter and nervous laughter and stuff, um, but afterwards, or after about 20 minutes, I say to them, okay, we're going to stop at the behavior chart. I want to first ask you, I ask a group of questions, did it work? Did that behavior system work? And they'll say, you know, well, I mean, I was quiet. Like, okay, good. Were you able to learn better? No, I was totally distracted by who was getting their names called and who was getting in trouble or um, I was so nervous, I just kept my eyes down, or those kind of things. Um, or what often happens is really fascinating, Tim. People start to call each other out, so they'll start to say things like, she's talking to you, you know, or whatever, because um, and I start to create this sort of community of, of competition. Mm-hmm. And um, that's one of the most powerful tools I use is to actually simulate what happens in K-12 schools across the country which is behavior management through a public display of humiliation. And I, I'm very, very serious when I talk to teachers afterwards because it's a very funny conversation because everybody admits how they felt. And, stuff. and I said, well, did it work? Did it work? I just want to know, does it work? And they said, well, it works to create silence and compliance, but it does not work to create community does not work to create an environment for learning to occur. Um, and it's a really big aha moment for most educators is that we're kind of going about this in the wrong way. And so a lot of the different things that I do in professional development, I would say are very, very instrumental in getting people to rethink mm-hmm. 
mm. what's typically done for kids with disabilities and kids without disabilities in public schools related to behavior. Um, now, do you think that professional development is really the only thing that needs to happen, you know, for, for us to move forward with inclusive schools? And let me just add one more thing because, Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of barriers to, Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's a lot of barriers to inclusive schools. Um, and, um, you know, not even at the top of the list is, is, uh, you know, attitudes, but, um, the, one of the biggest things is, um, is, uh, money or funds or, you know, how we restructure the, the delivery model of, of Mm -hmm. how we serve all of our kids, you know? Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, we have a school district, um, who wants to become more inclusive. How, how do they go about doing that when there isn't any more money than what they have because the economy and because the housing market and property Mm -hmm. taxes and, and all that stuff, uh, how does one, how does a school district go about moving in that direction? And, And can, can a school district really do that? you know, if they don't want to do it, you know, because it sounds like the schools that you've been working with have wanted this. Well, I, I'm sure you remember, I said 80% or more, right? Right. Uh, w- voted yes to a very lovely presentation about inclusion. And so I'm starting with schools that are saying for the most part, yeah, we're in, right? Okay. We're in. That's all they're saying. It's honestly the hardest work that I do, and I'm often working with schools that are somewhat on board, because we know in every school district, in every school, there's a very vocal minority, and they alone, that group, can really tank any any major school reform effort. Um, so it's a ton of work with the administrators to both expect people to disagree with the concept of inclusion and to prepare for the fact that they're going to disagree and want to slow it down and want to wait and want to, you know, try it next year, but not this year. Right. And so there are all these different ways that people respond to change in general, but I think especially change around inclusion. So your question was, was, is PD the answer? Um, Well, it's a great start in our current school system, but PD doesn't come, the most successful school reform efforts, we don't start with the PD. We actually start with the school reform work where we take all the existing educators on a map. We create these maps. And by map, I mean we show where all the teachers are and where all the students are, who's being pulled for what, who's being segregated, et cetera. And usually I bring it right to the teachers themselves and say, okay, so this is your current special ed model, and it's on one, you know, PowerPoint slide. What problems do you see inherent in the model right now? And so people come up with those, and we talk about what, what's working in the model and stuff like that. And then I give them the challenge. Well, if inclusive education was our goal, if it were to be our goal, what would need to happen in terms of moving children and teachers? So, Tim, you bring up the financial piece, which is really fascinating because We've proven, and by we, I mean many, many people have studied the fact that inclusive education is no more expensive than segregation. If we educate everybody in segregated settings and in resource room settings, um, we still have lots of special ed teachers. We still have lots of paraprofessionals. And in some many cases, segregated education is more expensive. So what we do in these school systems is we draw the maps of their school their service delivery model, We talk about the pros and cons of what's happening. And then we actually, kind of in a pretty democratic system, we have people redesign the model with their given teachers. It's not like we add five more teachers or, you know, 10,000 more dollars. or There's no more money. There's no more staff. But we say, what if, how would you rearrange things if all kids went back to their general education classrooms? So what that does is it ends up freeing up all these teachers that used to be working in 
segregated classrooms and resource rooms down the hall and closets. You know, people there are teachers working in all sorts of funny little ways to support kids with disabilities. But when we say kind of all hands on deck, everybody's in general ed, and they're usually um, now you can pair general and special education teachers together, and people can teach inclusively, which is a very very different way of doing it. So professional development is is step two. Step one is redesigning service delivery models. Did not, and, did, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, oh no. So, but I guess kind of it, in the larger the larger question is how do we influence inclusive education? That's one piece of it. Now, but those are that's with our existing schools. The other piece happens um, at the pre-service level, which is a lot of the work that I do in preparing soon-to-be general and special educators. Mm-hmm. To not think about services as a place, but instead that services are portable and should be brought to children. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, right now, well, every semester we graduate you know, at Syracuse University, we graduate um, about maybe 60 teachers who enter the workforce and really don't see that general and, and special education are different entities but really see special education as a portable service brought to children in the context of general ed. And so that's the other piece that I think is really hopeful to think about is the more we educate our pre-service teachers, um, not in those traditional old-fashioned ways of thinking where you walk down the hall to receive your special ed service or if you have a certain kind of disability, you're educated in a substantially separate location. Um, We just have generations of teachers who don't think that way. Um, I, actually, I'm glad that you said that because my, my experience actually, uh, in my teacher training was, um, much more, um, in that, in that vein of thinking where mm-hmm. general and special ed- education was what that we were, um, expected to collaborate. Uh, but mm-hmm. when I entered into the public schools, um, the schools were so far different from that line of thinking that it mm-hmm. was there was a big adjustment adjustment period um for me because um you know I got hired on as a self-contained teacher and mm-hmm. so I had to take the things that I learned and try to apply them in a in a context that wasn't friendly to it you see what I right. mean so oh, I... um I, I mean I and and I'm I'm happy that I'm happy that I had that training. I went to uh, Cal State University Fullerton um, mm-hmm. and um, had some wonderful professors um, and that got me rethinking how, you know, how that service del- delivery should look. Um, mm-hmm. um, and the other, the other thing um, I wanted to talk about what you said about changing and restructuring the service delivery is um I think I remember from reading the Schools of Promise research that mm-hmm. about 15% of the students in the schools that you were serving you know, had IEPs or mm-hmm. identified disabilities. Um, mm-hmm. Is there, um, in that restructuring, do you have mm-hmm. students go to their home schools and is that is is that a way of also restructuring the service delivery model? For instance, my my school, um, mm-hmm. we have about twenty percent actually of our students with identified needs um, mm-hmm. with IEPs. Now, our school is not their, you know, not all of our students. Um, we are not their home school. So, uh, how, how exactly did that work? And, and is that something you address? It definitely is. So what we do, just like you're describing, very often is we begin to bus kids around based on the fact that they have disabilities, which that alone is uh, fairly illegal, but we, that's a really common practice, right? Um, and so in any school district that we're working with, absolutely returning kids to their home school district is, uh, or their home school is really the goal. The problem for me comes in the actual, so these families have been told that their children have to go on a bus and go somewhere else because of their disability. Um, And so what I like to do with those families is to give them choice, right, to say either return to your home school 
or stay because we've already made this mess for you. And so if you're more comfortable here, let's just finish your schooling out here. But what we don't do is continue that process. So the new kindergartners coming in, they don't, they no longer get shipped. They instead stay in their home district Mm -hmm. or their home school. So that's kind of how, because like on a very sort of a student by student case, you can understand that it's just not fair to, for kids who've finally gotten, gotten settled in a district even if it's not their home district, to then make parents change again because of natural proportion. Absolutely. And so, right. And so that's kind of how we've done it. Um, and 20%, so the national average, I think we're at about 14%, which is what you'd expect in any one school. So you're a little higher in your district. Um, but what you do is you also, so that's the first thing, is you think about who's, who's here that shouldn't be and they're being bused. And then you start to think about, well, do they want to return to their home school? And if so, we'll help that. We'll help them do that. But the other thing is, um, in any one classroom, if 20% of your kids have labels, then in any one classroom, you would never expect to have more than 20% of children with labeled disabilities. And so that's the concept of natural proportions, which is really important in the redesign and the restructuring. Because so often, and, and you, might have, you might have seen this before, but people will say to me, Julie, you've got to see our inclusive school. It's amazing, you know, whatever. And so I'll go and I'll see it. And they'll say, like, um, see those kids over there? Those are our inclusion students, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. And it's like, what? You know, if you have inclusion students, you don't have inclusion. And the truth is um, we, we often see classrooms that are really, really densely populated with children with disabilities. So it might be 50% or 80% or, you know, whatever, and they'll call it, you know, an inclusion classroom. And so it's really important to not only pay attention to the homeschool rules, like children should attend the schools in which they would attend if they did not have a disability. So that's a really important rule. And the other is when you're doing this restructuring, look at your percentage, your, your actual percentage of kids who have disabilities, and then follow that throughout your entire school. So no classroom would have any more than 20% of kids with disabilities. Um, I mean, that, that sounds great. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask questions um, because I know that, like I said, I'm, I'm tracking with you and I agree with you, but mm-hmm. I want to make sure that people who, listen to this podcast or, you know, or, or, you know, when I have conversations with people and they bring up questions, um, right. you know, how do we address the, the real challenges of, of getting there, you know, because, yeah. you know, um, like what if a school doesn't have that 80% <laughs> buy-in, you know what I mean? Um, oh, right. so, and, and I, I guarantee you there's plenty of schools out there that, that don't have that 80%. So, um, I wanted to talk, uh, about legislation and about mm-hmm. the law. And, um, if, if what we have now under IDEA mm-hmm. is sufficient and, and, you know, we, we talk about in, in special ed, we always talk about least restrictive environment mm-hmm. and, do we need something different or more uh, to clarify and push forward inclusive schools? Or is what we have sufficient as long as we fulfill it? Does that make sense? I do. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Okay. Um, I want to just back up really quick with what you said related to the fact that most schools wouldn't be 80% interested in becoming inclusive. You're you're a hundred percent right. Most schools are not that interested in becoming inclu- inclusive, um, and those schools of promise schools were two examples of we, where we had a vote. And all the other schools that we worked with, and I mean, you know, hundreds of other schools now have not. They're just typical schools that people are not interested in becoming inclusive. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things is to just ask yourself, from my position, whether you're an educator, an administrator, whatever your position is. What do I have power and control over, and how can I create a more inclusive school? Um, and, and in some schools, we've been invited in just because a, a group of educators have said, hey, we want to do this, and we need your help, and so we'll come and really work with them. Um, so sometimes it's the ground level. It's educators themselves saying, come help us do this, and very often it's administrators. Um, 
and and sometimes it's because there's litigation, right? So mm-hmm. often I'm invited in because of a district who um, has lost in a due process hearing or a federal court case or a class action lawsuit, and the remedy is training for inclusion. So um, there are lots of reasons that schools become inclusive, and the law is one very important reason. So it's a great question. Um, so the spirit of the law is very much on our side, our side meaning it's the side of inclusion. So the spirit of the law is, you know, to the maximum extent appropriate children with disabilities, including kids in public or private schools, are educated with kids without disabilities, right? Right. And then the piece that's really useful to us is that, you know, removal happens only when the nature or severity of the disability of a child is such that education in regular classes with the use of supplemental aid supports and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. So the whole part, right, so I'm just going to, I know that's kind of wordy, but essentially it's this. You can only remove kids when you've exhausted all the supplemental aid supports and services. And the beauty is, I I happen to have a document that I think is like 20 pages long. It's kind of every supplemental aid support and service that's out there. So whether it's extended time to pacing of instruction to using multiple intelligence theory to um, a scribe to, you know, every adaptation, modification, accommodation that you can think of is on this list. And the beauty is when you, when, the, when you look at the law, it suggests that you can remove only when you've tried all those things first. And um, so one of my kind of the most important things I do is I'm very often called to be an expert in due process hearings, always related to inclusion, right, so LRE. Mm -hmm. And on the stand, when I'm, you know, kind of working against educators who are saying we can't include this child, I have that list of supplementary aid supports and services, and I'm going through one after another after another in front of a judge and saying, have you tried this? Well, have you tried this? How about this? Have you tried it? Have you tried it? And... Inevitably, the district can't prove their burden, which is that they've attempted all of these supplemental aid supports and services. Mm -hmm. Therefore, segregation is not really okay. And um, I think I'm I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but I'm saying it to show you where we are in terms of the spirit of the law. Right. Um, I've done nine cases since I've been here in Syracuse, and court cases, I mean, in federal court cases, and we've won all of them. And so the beauty is we're at this place in time where if you go to litigation, it is likely you'll win based on the spirit of the law. Right. Mm -hmm. And so your question was, what needs to change? Well, sure, would I love the language to change to be less wishy-washy because you know, to the maximum extent appropriate. Well, you see all that language is very difficult to prove. Um, But when you really lay your case out in a due process hearing and show that districts haven't met their burden of proof, um, it's not hard. It's not hard to prove that children should be included. Right. Um, Yeah. So that's been a lot of the work that I really enjoy doing. Okay. Um, that's uh, brilliant. <laughs> By the way, the uh, I love the list of uh, of accommodations and modifications. Um, I'll have to pass that on. <laughs> yeah. Um, one I think thing... there's a truncated. I was just going to tell you. I think there's a truncated version of it on Inspire Inclusion. Um, I think it's like the second video. That one comes with that. that uh, it's just it's a shorter version, but it's maybe seven pages in length. It's really, really good. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll look that up and um, put it yep. in the show notes. Um, yeah, great. One thing um, that I've heard over and over is um, about students not being able to be included in general ed because it's not academically appropriate or that they are so far behind in either math or reading or in globally, uh, you know, uh, you know, mm-hmm. across, across grade level, uh, content. Um, and, uh, in fact, 
um, well, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to name anybody specifically, um, but it, it's, you know, when parents want to have their students have one-on-one -on -one aids, you know, in general education, um, uh, districts typically balk at that because mm -hmm. they don't want to spend the money, you know, on, on that particular student to have, you know, the, um, the assistant to modify those activities or however they, they want to support that student because uh, they feel that student is served, you know, appropriately, like IDA says, in a another environment. So what would you tell parents if they came to you and said, you know, the district, um, you know, I have a, I have a, um, a third grade student and he is, you know, not reading at a third grade level. He's reading at a kindergarten level. A mm -hmm. In fact, uh, you know, he's just working on number sense. Um, mm -hmm. But I want him to be in, included with his peers. Mm -hmm. um, and the district is telling me it's not academically appropriate for him to be in third grade because mm -hmm. the curriculum needs to be modified so much that... Um, he has to be working on on other stuff so what how would you address that yeah so nowhere in the law does it say that students need to be you know at grade level right or close to grade level or no more than two grade levels below or you know there's nowhere that says that part and i think it's really fascinating because it's very often used right as a as a rationale to exclude because your child can't keep up or your child is below uh, grade level or ac uh, academically or whatever. And um, the whole point of special education is to provide portable services for children in the context of general education so that they can access general education content, age level, age level not chronologically you know, appropriate uh, content. And the whole goal the special education is accommodations, modifications, and adaptations so that they can be successful at their level, right? Right. So it is, ab it is absolutely appropriate and okay to make modifications. I mean, so when I, I taught special education, I taught elementary, middle, and high school special education. And what's really important to hear is that I had 12th graders who were reading at a kindergarten level, just decoding or barely decoding, and I was still including them in high school English courses. And so the question is, like, how do you, why would, how would that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, we pretty much at some point decide that decoding might not be in the students' near future, you know, in the, in the future for them. And so we can't, we can no longer just limit learning to what they can decode. And instead, we have to modify around the decoding problem. And we have to be able to put, give them the information. And so it's as simple as students would listen to the story, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and still be expected to respond to, you know, some of the comprehension questions, be participating in the dialogue, create their PowerPoint presentation about, about the book. You know, there's still a million things that they can do to participate. But when we limit learning to decoding skills, we basically hold thousands and thousands of children back from learning what they're capable of learning. And so at a, you just simply have to modify around those things. And there's nowhere in the law that says that kids have to be at a certain level in order to participate. Right. Modifications and adaptations are the law. That's part of what you have to do. Yeah, it is interesting um, because I've never actually heard anyone say that you know, um, use IDEA as, as saying, yeah, we are excluding a student because, you know, right. um, and, and that, and that is backed up by the law. It's, no, they don't say that. it's mostly because, well, this is just what we do as a district. This is how we've decided to handle this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, so, you know, thank you for addressing that because I think that's important um, for parents and for educators to know um, because 
you know, when you are advocating for a student um, and you come up with those, when you get those questions, um, mm -hmm. you can say with full certainty, there is nothing in the law that says that this student cannot be included. Um, what becomes difficult, I think, is how the district or the school, the local school, decides to do that, how they practically do that. Um, and whether that is through the classroom teacher, the general classroom teacher modifying those things, or whether it's a paraprofessional model uh, modifying those things, or in my case, um, I usually work with the general ed teacher and uh, my paraprofessional, and we work together to modify mm -hmm. those things for my students who go into general ed. So um, mm -hmm. it really, I think, comes back to the the that collaboration piece that you know, kind of changing how people think about inclusion, um, how to deal with behavior, and so on and so forth. Because um, most of the time, it, it seems that administrators, they, they just can't wrap their head around how that's going to look. Um, they want to protect their teachers, <laughs> you know. So right. So when you when you come to them or when parents or advocates come to the meetings and they say we want this, um, they just don't know what that looks like, so that they they shut them down. Um, right. Um, is is there any? Um, in, I guess in your in your opinion, is there any um, research that you kind of think is the silver bullet as far as? Um, moving inclusion, inclusive education forward. Um, like I, I know it's, it seems to me that the, the research that you've done, you know, with schools of promise and in going forward really sets the bar because like you said, you go to administration, you go to the, the, um, superintendents and you say, look, this actually increases student learning across the board you know, and then you, then you've piqued their interest. Is there, is there something else or is there another k kind of research that you've found to be effective? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I have this really long list of research studies that I make my graduate students and undergrad students read and I find to be really, really useful. But I think in the practical and, and I have a list of the, I can, I don't know how to get it to you, but I have a list of kind of the, the best of the best in my opinion. Um, but I think nobody does, no, uh, minds and hearts aren't changed because of research. Hmm. Um, I, because if people are not interested in creating inclusive schools, I could give them a stack of 300 peer reviewed research articles about why inclusion is better. And it's, not going to change their minds, right? It's just not. Um, I mean, I am a researcher and I do that work and I find it to be really important and uh, useful in making part of my claims and to kind of move inclusion forward. But I think ultimately it's the work of hearts and minds. It's So uh, I run a summer leadership institute at Syracuse um, with my colleague George Theo Harris and we run this leadership institute and it's for 200 or so superintendents and principals and special ed directors, and they come from all over the country. We spend five days with them, and all our work is how to create and maintain inclusive schools. And the research part is just a tiny piece that we kind of go over and talk about, and they can learn more about it if they're interested. But I can tell you this, there's never been a school administrator that said, I just need like five more studies, you know, to show me that it really works. You know, or just give, you know, it's actually, I make this joke a lot. So I, uh, okay, so I have all these slides and on the slides and it's small print. It's just study after study after study after study that shows that inclusion is better for kids with disabilities socially. It's better for kids with disabilities academically. It's better for kids without disabilities socially. It's better for kids without disabilities academically. It's better for the school community. It's better for the school. You know, it doesn't matter. It's just tons and tons of studies, right? And then... I asked the question in the audience, does anybody, has anyone ever seen The Biggest Loser? And people will raise their hand, like that show on TV. Yeah, people have seen it. And I say, well, 
So here's the deal. I've seen every episode of The Biggest Loser, and um, I think we're into, like, far into the seasons, and I'm not really an exercise physiologist, or I don't study exercise science, but I think there's some research out there that suggests that um, something like the, the fewer calories you eat and the more calories you burn, the, the more likely you are to lose weight. And I, joke, I jokingly say, has anyone ever heard of like that research? Has anyone heard of it before, right? Mm-hmm. And, of course, everyone laughs and their hands go up, right? And I say, okay, well, um, in, in education, there's nothing more clear when it comes to research. Like, there are lots of strands of research in education, but one of the most clear pieces, lines of research, is that when kids are in general education, they do better. Right? It's just crystal clear in the research. And, I mean, I know how to lose weight. I know how because I've um, watched the show The Biggest Loser. I've read lots of articles. I've read lots of research light in magazines and things like that. And I think the research is really clear there, too. But the question is, like, when am I going to get on the treadmill, you know? And I think it's it's the same in education. When are we going to get off the couch? We know this is better for kids. And the research isn't going to do that for us. So what does do it for us? Uh, I think it's a combination of of, uh, inspiration, the law, um, and then lots and lots of practical, useful ideas Mm -hmm. so that people know what to do, Right. right? So I can say, yeah, include a kid with autism, right? Okay, great. I can tell you to do that. I can tell you the law says you should do it, right? But when you're the teacher and you're looking at this kid who has interesting behavior, who isn't verbal, and I'm, you know, reading, you know, I'm, we're using the book uh, Where the Red Fern Grows, and I have to figure out how Adam is going to be engaged in this class with this novel. Um, unless I've given lots of ideas and strategies to a team of people they don't know what to do. And right. because of, it's not because they don't have good intentions, it's because they just don't know what to do. I mean, I worked with a team that I've been working with from one of the schools, the Promise Schools, uh, recently, and it was great because that exact problem came up. And Adam, kid with autism, uh, is, they're trying to figure out what to do with Adam during where the red fern grows. And uh, the first thought was, you know, he's probably going to need a sensory break. So what if we just did that? And someone said, well, it doesn't really fit with our commitment to inclusion. And so right away it was like a problem to solve. And this team who's really, really full of ideas, you know, now after working with our team for a long time, they said, okay, he's going to need a fidget. So let's give everybody a fidget. Let's put fidget bags on every table. Let's have the fidgets relate to the story. You know, he's going to need to stand. What if we put graffiti paper on the wall? Okay, not just for Adam, though. Let's put it up everywhere. And in, like, three minutes, they solved this problem of what to do with Adam during where the red fern grows. And I happened to watch this actual lesson, and it was beautiful. The paraprofessional starts the lesson and says, so there's graffiti paper on the wall, so anybody who wants to write or draw or outline while you're listening to the story, feel free. There's markers out there. You know, and she explains that. And then as they were reading, the teacher says, um, after they fi- finished chapter four or something, she says, okay, everybody, go grab your fidget bags. Pull out, pull out something. How does it relate to the story at the moment? And I listened to two other kids, not Adam, but two other kids without disabilities, who say, oh, they pull out these little trees, and they go, oh, this reminds me of the giant sequoia trees that the two dogs in the story, old Dan and little Anne, were under, and blah, 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 blah. And... Um, I just realized that, like, by changing the lesson a little bit for Adam, the lesson became so much better for everybody else. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's a lot of the skill. It's just a lot of the ideas. And when they have those ideas, it's amazing because then their stories become their own inspiration as opposed to kind of listening to it from the outside. Oh, that's That's awesome. Um, I love that. Um, it's universal design at work, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, well, we're, you know, we're running up to, uh, about an hour here and, uh, yeah. and it's, it's been a, a pleasure to talk with you. Um, I want to make sure that you had an opportunity to, 
talk about your website or if you are in any other social media or you know how how what's the best way to people for people to contact you if they would like to to work with you um okay well yep so my website is um inspire inclusion and that's for parents of kids with disabilities who want their children included so that's a great place to turn um I have a Facebook page called Inspire Inclusion. Um, that's a great place to go. Lots of I just put up lots of inspirational stuff there. And actually, Tim, I find your work to be really useful because sometimes I share things that you've said and things. So thank you for that. Of course. Um, yeah. And then um, I've written some books that I think are probably useful to this conversation. Um, the Paraprofessional Handbook for effective support in inclusive classrooms is available through Amazon. And that's for paraprofessionals out there who might be interested in learning how to better support students. Um, I just wrote a book called uh, The Principles Handbook for Effective Support in Inclusive Education. And so this is a great book. <clears throat> Parents often give it to their principals. Um, and it's really, really useful in terms of how do I create and maintain inclusive schools a lot of your questions today, Tim, related to the structure of schooling and uh, the ins and outs of kind of how to make it work are all in there. Um, I've just written the Occupational Therapist Guide and the Speech and Language Pathologist Guide to Inclusive Support to Inclusive uh, Education. So it's really how do we do all those related services inclusively. And this year, I'm writing the General Ed Teachers and the Special Ed Teachers Guide to Inclusive Education. So those books will be um, really great reads for teams to read across, so every member of the team can have their own copy that's really about their own role. Um, so I'm really excited about that. So that's something that might be useful. Um, another free thing that I have is called, um, it's an app called I Advocate. Um, and that's for parents of kids with disabilities who might be um, wanting to know what to say when their district tells them that their child can't be included. <clears throat> so what I've done is put all the reasons that districts are likely to say that their child can't be included and then how to respond and then court cases that relate to that. So I kind of give parents a really, I think it's a really, really nice tool and we've created that at Syracuse University. Um, and then my email is uh, julie at inspireinclusion.com and I take lots of requests for speaking engagements and those kind of things um, or also work on due process hearings through that particular email address. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, telling us about all those resources. I, I had no idea um, about the, about the books that you had written. So I, that that's going to be on my list <laughs> oh, great. of things. Thank you. So really great stuff. Thank you so much for joining us and um, all the best in your uh, future endeavors. Thank you so much, Sam, and keep in touch. Absolutely. That concludes this edition of the Think Inclusive Podcast. For more information about Dr. Julie Ann Costin, you can follow her on Facebook, Inspire Inclusion, or on her website, www.inspireinclusion.com. You can find a link to download the checklist of sample supplemental supports, aids, and services on the show notes page of the Think Inclusive Podcast. Remember, you can always find us on Twitter at Think underscore inclusive or on the web at thinkinclusive.us today's show was produced by myself talking into usb headphones using a newly refurbished macbook pro garage band and a skype account bumper music by jose galvez with the song press you can find it on itunes you can also subscribe to the think inclusive podcast via the itunes music store or podomatic.com the largest community of independent podcasters on the planet. From Marietta, Georgia, please join us again on the Think Inclusive podcast. Thanks for your time and attention.